tell you why there was an engine here in the 1800s, what this one is, and we'll start it up and run it. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Back then in the 1800s, there was a large building on a flat spot back here. Uh, and the flat spot's still there, but the building's long gone. There was the pack house, and as the name implies, that's why they packed the powder in the case for ship. But the powder came up here from the glazing mill and had a lot of dust in it. And if you, they had to take the dust out because it would degrade the performance of the powder. So they had a cylindrical screen device called a bolter. It's a big cylinder with different sized screens on the wall of the cylinder. It sat at an angle and it turned. You put the powder at the high end and it works its way down across the different screens. Of course, the dust would come out first in the final screen. So it worked fine, except they needed power to turn it. And if you look out here, the brandy line's here, but there's no mill race. The next dam is just downstream. So they couldn't put a water wheel or turbine here. So they put a small steam engine like this one, just to turn this shaft that's over your head. Shaft stops at that opening now, but it went back another 60 feet and back into the pack house, and all day long, the little engine would chug along, turning the shaft, turning that bolter. Uh, then, late in the 1800s, they brought water power into this room by way of a line shaft that came up alongside the roadway. You can look out in the yard and see a big block of stone with the bottom of a barrier on it. They threw the wall, and then they could drive this shaft with either water power or steam. And actually, in those years, there were nine steam engines in the yard, mainly here as backup power. Because, again, as beautiful as the Brennan line is, there's not always that much water out there in a hot, dry summer or in a real bad winter. And if you can't, they had 33 roll mills, which you probably haven't seen yet, but, and with a bunch of other machinery. And if you're in the black powder business, you've literally got to keep those roll mills rolling to make powder. So they used steam as backup. But whenever the river, the water came back at the river, they went back to it because they're a whole lot cheaper than having a couple of guys shovel coal into each of nine boilers all day long, right? So that's the why, the what. This is a railroad-style boiler. Looks like a railroad engine without wheels. Fire doors at the end. I set the fire this morning with paper and killing and wood as you would at home, and then it sets up and shoveling soft coal. So we have a good bed of soft coal in there, burning coal. Uh, the middle section is a horizontal fire tube boiler. There are 54 two-inch tubes through which the hot air and gases from the firebox pass to the smoke box and out the stack. Surrounding the tubes in the boiler is, of course, about 300 gallons of water, right? So this is just a big old tea kettle here. You boil the water, generate steam, collects in the dome. We've got about 52 pounds right now. Plenty for you to visit. It takes 15 minimum to run the engine. It took me about an hour and a half this morning to get up 15 from 0 to 15. So the steam comes over my head in the insulated line. All I have to do to start the engine is open this valve. Jackson High viscosity oil into the intake steam to lubricate the seal of the piston. Single cylinder, 9 inch diameter piston, 12 inch travel. So the steam pressure both directions so it can move this crosshead back and forth, turn the crank, turn the 1800 pound flywheel. This offset crank here is pushing a rod back and forth in the valve block. It simply switches the steam from one side of the piston to the other as it moves back and forth. The belt is driving what's called a fly ball governor. As the engine runs faster and faster, the balls come up by a centrifugal force. They're about 60 RPM, they're up high enough to push that stem down and limit the amount of steam. And so that would prevent a runaway uh, engine. Now you can take power off the flywheel with the cowhide belt up to the big pulley power. That shaft and the second belt bring the power back and now the shaft will be ahead of its turn. We used to have rings that dance around the south. The engine is quiet for two reasons. It's small, and the exhaust steam is vented out through that wall through a separate step. So you don't hear the chug, chug, chug. All you hear is a flash from that process. In 1921, when the yards closed, they sold off and got out essentially all the machinery. And so when the museum decided to recreate this engine house, the only one of the nine was had. They had to go out and buy similar superior equipment. The boiler was built in 1930, similar to what was here. There's really only two things critical about a boiler. It has to produce sufficient steam, that pressure, safety, underlying safety, right? And this one does. The only connection between the two is the steam one. The little engine was found in the basement of the textile mill in Philadelphia. Uh, the basement 
the pillow, it kind of oily water, protected the metal, they hauled it up, cleaned it off, and they saw swatches of the bright green and bright red paint. And that's a reflection of the thinking in the Victorian era that the Phoenix should be aesthetically beautiful for a point. I guess it's a Phoenix beautifully with the beautiful work. I don't know how that worked out. Now this uh, thing is that something that all should have in the beginning. Primarily a repair facility. If someone came in from the yard with gear that looked like this, doesn't look like it's too functional. Mm -hmm. okay. So they come in here and they say, We need a new one. They couldn't go to Lowe's or Home Depot. So this was the next best thing. And they'd start out with a block of metal, a round of metal, if you will, uh, look like this and they would load it in place of this piece in the lathe. And the lathe and all the other tools in here are cutting tools. So we would remove all the material that we didn't need, and we'd get to a blank that looked similar to this, which looks a little, a little closer to what we're looking for, right? Now, once we've removed all the outer material, we could remove this unit and push the drill bit forward and that would increase the diameter of the hole. In this case, excuse me, the drill bit stays fixed from the piece you want the hole in it rotates. Opposite of what you would expect. Mm -hmm. Alright, so how did we power all of this machinery? Well, we used the water in the mill race and we used so much that it's all gone. No, just kidding. Hello. <laughs> uh, in the corner of this building, there's a, a kluski. We'd raise the, the uh, barrier, allow water to flow down through the pipe to a uh, hydro turbine, just like the one that you saw at the roll mill. 
We have found the hydro turbine that's been stuck in the mud for over 100 years. We resurrected it, cleaned it up, and we are in the process of reestablishing water power to this shop. And that's what that uh, contraption is out there with the two wheels on it. And we're going to be having that uh, rope go across the mill race and attaching to a wheel outside the wall here. And then that big wheel will drive this center line shaft. And all of the machines are linked to the center line shaft by leather straps. <coughs> and once the center line shaft is in motion, we can turn on one or more machines as needed. At the moment, we have a backup. We have a five horsepower motor. So we'll turn that on let you see how the, some of these machines work. And you can make believe that it's going to be going on. So this is actually quite interesting that you have the opportunity to look into the uh, empty building like this and see what the problem is going on over here. Now, in addition to the lighting and air conditioning of the 1870s, we also have the safety features which means we don't have any safety features. <laughs> so our attempt to keep you safe is that when the machines are in motion, if you stay at about the level of the metal buttons on the floor, you'll be safe. All right. So that's going to make some noise. And that's one other thing that we're looking forward to when we get the water power that it will be a little more quiet. Here. We could go faster, and in fact, we used. 
question. That's what these gears are for. So if we take this leather strap off of here and put it on this wheel, we would then have to take this fine piece of machinery, and if I was tall enough, I would reach up here and put that leather strap on the corresponding wheel here. And that would make it go faster. several teeth knocked off. So what they did is they drilled holes in line with the center of the tooth, tapped it, and put bolts in place. And that was a quick fix to get them back in the business. In this case, you see the square cuts at the base of the tooth, indicating that they removed the entire tooth, probably with the shaper, and then put a piece of metal in place and bolted it, and then used the appropriate multiple cutting tool here, it's in the shape that we need, and shear up the edges of the bolt so that they would mesh with the other gear. Same thing over here. Now these are quick fixes because to make a gear of this size would have taken six to seven days worth of work. And they couldn't afford to be out of business that long, so this was their uh, attempt to get going. Uh, we have a, a different cutting tool, multiple head cutting tool, that's in the shape of the gear, the, of the tooth that we want to create. And so we go back to our uh, piece that we're following here and we cut all the way around with this cutting tool until we get our final piece. Okay? Now that would have taken three to four days worth of work. Now, both of these cutting tools were used on a new generation of machinery called the milling machine. And you can see we've got a uh, cutting tool mounted here. This cutting tool effect effectively replaced the shaper because you could get a piece of a cutting tool that would cut a very wide swath of flat material much more efficiently than the so I like to describe this machine. I tell everybody it has a computer associated with it. And everybody says, 1870s, computer? I said, yes, here's the hard drive. And this is, in fact, the brains of the operation. It's mounted in this location, and it turns out that 40 turns of this wheel We'll rotate the piece that you're working on in one revolution. So we'll do an easy example. Suppose you wanted a gear with 10 teeth. 10 goes into 40, how many times? 40. You didn't know I'd be asking questions.
and it has to rotate two and two nineteenths. So we're a little closer, right? It turns out each of these index wheels has a different number of holes in each circle. So you find the one that has 19 holes in it, and you mount it in place. You set up your first cut, you make your cut, you mark where you started, you go one, two, and two more holes. It's two nineteenths, the fraction that we're looking for. Blacksmith, because maybe he could have knocked it out oh. together. 